Tonight, a massive tornado leaves a path of destruction in central Alberta. I'm telling you, I just started to cry. It was devastating. Homes flattened, livestock killed, but officials say it could have been so much worse. A deadly mass shooting at a summer block party, 28 injured, half of them kids. This is insanity. This cannot, cannot be the society that we are expected to live in. Ottawa's new public art that's ruffling feathers. Well, some of the comments were like, oh, this is so ugly. <laughs> this is The National with David Common. Ian is away tonight. A community in Alberta is picking up the pieces after a massive tornado touched down, leaving behind destroyed homes and residents in shock. This is what people were staring down in the distance. And before long, that twister reached the community with a vengeance, staying on the ground for about 20 minutes. The area that was hit hardest is located in a rural part of central Alberta called Mountain View County. It's right between Calgary and Red Deer. And as Anise Hadari shows us, the damage there is significant, but the outcome could have been much worse. On the ground, the aftermath seems unreal. It almost looks like airplanes crashed here, but what it is is the total destruction of two homes that just uh, have been shredded and, the, and spread everywhere. Eliza Humphreys lost a lot in the storm, including livestock. She was shocked to see how little was left. I got here and phoned my son and I said, there, there's nothing here. There's nothing here, it's all gone, right? Estimates put Saturday's tornado between one and two kilometers wide. Funnel cloud observed to the northwest of Carstairs. Hitting a rural area between Calgary and Red Deer, no major injuries, but homes were destroyed. Like here, where a resident only survived by hiding in her basement. There is a significant amount of damage over a, a fairly big distance, uh, and it is going to take um, some, some, uh, some teamwork to get through it all. And it wreaked havoc for almost twice as long as a typical twister. At this time, uh, we're looking at at least 20 minutes. Uh, it's likely that it was on the ground a little bit longer. Experts say nearby high-risk areas didn't take as much damage, but community members are shocked at how quickly their surroundings changed. This is devastating. It's, uh, it's very surreal. You, know, you, you, know, you could drive by here you know, most days and you see the big trees and the farms and stuff, and now it's just destroyed. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. The official count stands at three houses destroyed and six more damaged. There's 15 residents who were affected by the, uh, the tornado that came in here right now, so we're trying to help out with all the local residents. And locals are coming together as well. Even people Eliza Humphreys had never met before. It's a good community. Carstairs, Alberta is wonderful. The people here are wonderful, and they've really, they've really showed up and turned out to help. Even with that help, it could take years to rebuild what was taken away in just 20 minutes. Anise Haydari, CBC News, Calgary. Police in Quebec are searching for two people who were swept away during a landslide in the community of Rivière Eternité. The pair went missing in the midst of a storm that quickly dropped up to 100 millimeters of rain on Saturday. A third person also had to be rescued. They were taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. In BC, a wildfire is just two kilometers away from the center of Kelowna, with many residents now being told to be ready to leave home at a moment's notice. That's about 150,000 people under an evacuation alert as water bombers work to keep the flames on Knox Mountain from spreading any further. That fire already the size of about 16 football fields, but currently listed as under control. After multiple days of heavy smoke, air quality warnings in most of Quebec and Ontario have been lifted. While the worst of it has passed in the major cities, warnings are still in place further north where dozens of wildfires remain out of control. Tonight, police in France are once again out in force, tens of thousands of them on the streets after five straight nights of protests sparked by the fatal police shooting of a teen. And as Sarah Levitt shows us, one particularly violent incident is shocking many. 45,000 French police officers were again deployed across the country Sunday after days of protests and violence. 
More than 700 people were arrested Saturday night, down from more than 1,300 the night before. But some of the violence more targeted. This is all that remains of a car after protesters drove it into a local mayor's home in a suburb of Paris, setting it on fire. Vincent Jean Brun wasn't home, but his wife and kids were. She broke her leg escaping. One of the kids was also injured. Jean Brun says there's no doubt the individuals wanted to set the house on fire. Prosecutors have opened an investigation into attempted murder. This was all sparked by the fatal police shooting of a 17-year-old boy named Nael on Tuesday. He was shot while driving away from a police traffic stop. His grandmother is now appealing for calm. The people rioting right now, I'm telling them to stop, Nadia told a French news station. Stop breaking windows and targeting buses. It's moms who take those buses, she said. Instead of an official trip to Germany, President Emmanuel Macron spent Sunday night in yet another crisis meeting. But many say the president is failing to address the root causes of the problem. Nael's death has further ignited an already deep rift between police officers and minority communities. It's far beyond a question of reform. There's also a need for French authorities to acknowledge that systemic racism in France is real uh, and to enact uh, policies to actually address it. The French government says accusations of systemic discrimination are totally unfounded. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. The city of Baltimore is reeling from a mass shooting that put 14 children in hospital. It happened during a summer block party, a neighborhood celebration held every year. Katie Simpson shows us the clear frustration of a city scarred by gun violence. In a neighborhood full of young families, the reality of this tragedy is setting in. The crime scene spans blocks with reminders of the party that was underway when shots rang out, still in full view. This was a reckless, cowardly act of violence uh, that has taken two lives and altered uh, many, many more. It was shortly past midnight when the 911 calls came in. Police say at least two people pulled guns and opened fire at an annual block party in a public housing community. We don't know if they were targeted or if they were just shooting indiscriminately down the street or up the street. The victims range in age from 13 to 32. Of the 30 people shot, 14 are children. This is insanity. This cannot cannot be the society that we are expected to live in. Local and state officials made familiar pleas for change to reduce gun violence, a demand Baltimore's top trauma surgeon has been making for years. I don't think it's written down anywhere that somebody has to pick up a gun and shoot a another person. And so to me, these are 100% preventable. Dr. Thomas Scalia is the physician in chief at the country's only dedicated trauma hospital. He says it's rare that he doesn't have to treat a gunshot wound during a shift. Gun violence is so common in his city that when he sits down with a family to tell them their loved one is dead, it's not necessarily a shock. You know, these moms, parents, they're very grief stricken that this has happened, but they're not actually surprised. It's part of the life in the city of Baltimore. And Katie, this marks the 338th mass shooting in the U.S. just this year. Yes, and the U.S. is well on its way to have another year with more than 600 mass shootings. They've passed that mark the last three years in a row. Lawmakers had hoped perhaps this year might be different. After the elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Congress passed legislation they described as the most significant in decades. Regulations to make it harder to get a gun. Programs to encourage states to pass red flag laws. For all the congratulations in Washington about reaching compromise in a divided Congress and actually passing some legislation, there does not appear to be major change in gun violence trends in this country. Katie Simpson, thank you. Thanks. Just west of Toronto, a Canada Day shooting has left one victim in critical condition tonight. Three others are stable. Police are looking for at least one suspect. They believe last night's shooting near a commercial plaza in Mississauga was targeted. 
but they say the victims have not been forthcoming with information. An alleged getaway vehicle was found 40 kilometers away. Port workers are on strike in B.C. More than 7,000 are off the job for the second day. There is particular concern about the impact from the slowdown at Canada's biggest port in Vancouver. Susanna Da Silva explains what it could mean for supply chains. Most of the goods that pass through these registers arrived at one of D.C.'s ports. Staples for the Indian community that I know is like rice and lentils. They're all imported, they come by containers, and uh, if it doesn't come out, prices will go high, there, there will be shortages. Unwelcome challenges at a time when store owner Vanita Kumar says inflation is already affecting customers. With, you know, the interest rate hike and the gas prices, and now this again, how much can anybody absorb? Okay, can I get 10 more guys to go to Centrum because we're going to need guys to man the street? More than 7,000 workers at 30 B.C. ports walked off the job Saturday. The port says one-third of all of Canada's trade outside of North America moves through the port of Vancouver. Some business groups are already calling on the federal government to step in. A week is five and a half billion dollars of disrupted trade. We saw the uh, the fragility of our supply chains and, uh, and and our trade corridors and any disruption at this point can send off a ripple effect. You know, people shouldn't be panicking. But this professor who studies supply chains believes the strike would have to drag on a few weeks for major impact. There is a mechanism to legislate them back to work. This is probably a six-year deal, so it's not the end of the world if it takes a bit of time to find, to find the right deal between the parties. Canada's Minister of Labour said in a statement, we are not looking past the bargaining table because the best deals are made at the table. Federal mediators continue to support the parties in their negotiations. The federal government must stay out of our business. And a warning from the union if the government position were to change. There will never be labour peace on the waterfront. This deal must be reached at the collective bargaining table. Both sides say they expect negotiations to continue. Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Further south in Los Angeles, thousands of hotel workers are also on strike. Cooks, dishwashers and front desk staff walked off the job during the busy July 4th holiday weekend. They're pushing for better wages and benefits. Their union says they've suffered from pandemic job cuts while industry profits soared and workers are struggling to afford housing. Twitter is now limiting how many tweets users can view each day. For most, that's about a thousand. Twitter owner Elon Musk initially set stricter limits, but then walked it back hours later. Some users were locked out of their accounts when their allotment was up. Musk says the limits are temporary to address what he calls, quote, extreme levels of data scraping. Frustration tonight over that record $50 million fine leveled at Canada Bread for price fixing. Customers won't see any of that money. Sophia Harris explains why the federal government gets to keep the cash. Grocery shoppers are happy to hear Canada Bread has been fined $50 million for fixing the price of bread. But some are disappointed that the fine will be paid to the federal government. The government didn't buy that amount of bread and uh, they shouldn't get that money. It should go to uh, the, the consumers. When a company does something wrong, they should give back to the people who they wronged. Last week, major baked goods producer Canada Bread admitted it colluded to fix bread prices, resulting in price hikes in 2007 and 2011. The Competition Bureau says this is a significant development in its ongoing investigation into an alleged industry-wide bread price-fixing scheme. Very serious uh, crime. Um, bread, as we all know, is a staple of the Canadian diet. Even so, this law expert says the main purpose of criminal prosecutions is to punish bad actors, not dole out compensation. It's exceptional to provide for compensation for victims. And she says it would be challenging to figure out how to disperse the cash. I suspect the costs would, would be well over uh, what, might, what people might get in the end and who would oversee it. But some Canadians say the $50 million could easily be donated to charity, such as food banks, which are facing growing demand. I think that's actually a very good idea, especially with the ongoing uh, crisis in Toronto regarding a lot of people being homeless. 
requiring a company to make a donation isn't unusual. In 2022, Keurig agreed to give $800,000 to an environmental charity for misleading claims its coffee pods could be recycled. But the Competition Bureau says Keurig was a civil case and that Canadians should pursue civil litigation to try to get compensation for bread price fixing. Two class action lawsuits are already doing this, but those cases could be tied up in the courts for years. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. When you take your cardboard recycling to the curb, you may not realize that some of that paper has plastic in it. Canada ships most of it to India, where it becomes a much bigger pollution problem. CBC News' Pratush Dayal went to northern India and shows us the consequences. This is a load of recyclable paper waste from Canada. We export a lot of it to India, at least 84,000 tons so far this year. But in that paper waste, there is a problem. The plastic waste they should retain in the Canada itself. <laughs> it should not come to India. Environment and Climate Change Canada says since January, 11 containers of waste paper shipped to India have been returned due to plastic contamination. There are almost 30 paper mills in and around Muzaffar Nagar and CBC News spoke with the majority of them. The consensus remains there is plastic waste coming in with Canadian waste paper supposed to be recycled here. To remove plastic we have to put our labour and the disposal is also we have to send it to the far the government plants, cement plants to get it for the recycle. This is the juice pack. Abhishek Agarwal's company processes thousands of tons of Canadian paper waste every month. This is, yes, from Canada imported. These piles are full of familiar brands. The pulp goes through the pulp mill, different equipment of screening and washing. This is screen passing out the fiber in final pulp. And this is the reject plastic waste here. We remove this and throw outside. 10% tak agar plastic. Agarwal tells me there is usually 10% plastic contamination in these 500 ton bales. Some of that plastic piles up in landfills along the outskirts of town. Mostly, it is burned, sending microplastic ash into the air. Fine particulate matter in Muzaffar Nagar air usually hover at 7 to 8 times higher than the WHO air quality guidelines. Canadian authorities do inspect waste exports, but say exporters are responsible for following the rules. Canada, US. Padam Bansal wants Canadian authorities to clamp down. Whatever prescription internationally is allowed in the waste paper, more than that should not come to any country. As the next load of Canadian waste rolls in, the hope for a plastic-free import remains. Pratish Tayal, CBC News, Muzaffar Nagar. A Canadian artist is using trash to make a statement, but some think it's garbage. Oh, this is so ugly. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing piece of artwork there. It's getting people talking. The artist tells us what's behind the rubber roadkill. Next. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. A tap on the shoulder that had us spinning. Yeah, hi, why don't we? We can. But first. A risky dive lands a Canadian on the podium. We're back in two. Now that is Canadian diver Molly Carlson plunging into the water from more than 20 meters up, all part of the Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series stop in Italy today. She came in second. An Australian diver took first place. It is the third event of the season, the next one in Japan. A new art installation in Ottawa has people talking. Made of recycled materials, the piece is a commentary on commuter culture. But as Marina von Stackelberg tells us, some say it's a bit too much. People are flocking to see it. Five meters long, scavenged from recycled tires. The depiction of a dead crow, called when the rubber meets the road. I saw some of the comments were like, oh, this is so ugly. <laughs> so I 
I thought I have to see it for myself. That's, that's an amazing piece of artwork there. Uh, it really does get the impression across of, of a crow. Whether or not people appreciate uh, what it is, it's getting people talking. That talk on social media, calling it morbid or construction material dumped in a heap. Others critical the federal government paid $14,000 for it. But the artist says his feathers aren't ruffled. I would say the worst outcome for a work of art is that it doesn't get noticed or doesn't get any reaction. And the fact that it does get a reaction, that it does get people talking, uh, discussing why it's there, what it is, is exactly what is, is probably the best outcome in the long run. He says the crow symbolizes the collision between humans and nature, made of the very material that causes roadkill, a commentary on commuter culture's impact on the environment. The piece is about the kind of risk and reward in our collision with the natural world as we deal with an environmental crisis moving forward. The crow premiered five years ago on PEI, but the artist says he's never had such a strong reaction. It's been mostly in small cities and some rural locations that a larger audience probably just has a larger spectrum of reactions. This crow will be on display for the next year. After that, the artist says he hopes that another public space will take it on in a new city to keep more Canadians talking. Marina Von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. As thousands continue to flee the war in Ukraine, Holocaust survivors were moved to help. How the small community is making a big difference. She pointed to the refugees and said that was us 80 years ago. And... It's crazy that this becomes a full-out gun. The troubling rise of untraceable weapons printed in just hours. So where there would be a serial number, there's just nothing. Exactly. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world next. Ukraine is under siege tonight. This is a drone attack on the capital city of Kyiv over the weekend. The first such attack from Russia in nearly two weeks. City officials say all eight exploding drones were detected and shot down, but there was damage and one person was injured by falling debris. It's these attacks that have forced millions to flee Ukraine over the last 18 months. More than a million have ended up in Poland. In the city of Krakow alone, the population has grown by 10%, with 80,000 Ukrainians finding refuge. Terence McKenna recently traveled to Poland and had a close-up look at one of the most impressive refugee relief operations there, from Krakow's tiny Jewish community. In the early hours of February 24th, 2022, as the first Russian rockets were fired into Ukraine, Maria Lysenko was in bed in the suburbs of Kyiv. I was sleeping. In the morning, my sister came running with her little son. She knocked on the window and screamed, Masha, it's war. I looked out the window and said, Tanya, what are you talking about? What war? I was in shock. At first, I thought she was joking. She said, it's really war, just go outside. People came out, some had blood on their heads. Children, they were crying, women were falling on their knees. Everyone was in shock when they fled from Kiev. Executions in Bucha, Urpin, this was really scary. Sirens, screaming, those rockets every night, tanks, explosions on the road. It was very scary. Maria and her sister Tanya gathered up their children and ran for their lives leaving their husbands behind to fight. They headed for Poland. We left at seven in the morning. We were at the border in three or four days. We crossed the border before midnight, first, ours, then the Polish. Maria says her family was rescued at the Polish border by volunteers from the JCC, the Jewish Community Center in Krakow. I was told that there was this organization and it would help us, and they gave me a place to live, took me under their wing, and are helping me to this day. Maria ended up at the JCC headquarters in Krakow, where to this day hundreds of Ukrainian refugees line up every morning for supplies of free food, 
medicine, and even disposable diapers. Historically, there have been a lot of tensions between Ukrainians and Jews. Nobody was too sure how the small Jewish community here in Krakow would react to the massive influx of Ukrainian refugees. The outcome has been quite stunning. This is the Jewish quarter of Krakow called Kazimierz, named after Kazimierz the Great, who is the only Polish king to be called the Great. And he was the one, uh, about 500 years ago, who welcomed the Jews to Poland. American Jonathan Ornstein is director of the Krakow JCC and effectively the general in charge of the massive relief effort mounted by the tiny Jewish community here. We've helped uh, well over 200,000 Ukrainian refugees. We're still helping about a thousand a day. That's mostly women and children. And the absolute vast majority, probably 98 percent at least, of those that we've helped and continue to help are not Jewish. And we do this because this is the right thing to do. We do this also mindful of the fact that 80 years ago, when the Jews were the victims here, um, there wasn't too much help. 80 years ago, there was a thriving Jewish community in Krakow. It was wiped out by the Nazis in the Second World War. Many of the residents of this neighborhood ended up being murdered in the nearby Nazi death camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. This group of elderly Krakow Jews were children who survived the Holocaust. They happened to be holding their monthly meeting at the community center when the food bank for Ukrainian refugees was being set up in the next room. One of the survivors stood up and she herself was a child in the Warsaw Ghetto and had been saved. And she looked across the hall, she pointed to the refugees and said, that was us 80 years ago. And she said, I propose that we take our annual dues, which I think are about 10 or $12 each, and we donate them to help Ukraine. And one by one, these elderly survivors put their hands up and voted to give their, their support to Ukraine. We see that jeżeli się dzieje krzywda i możemy jakoś pomóc, no to pomagamy właśnie w taki sposób, jak, jak można było. Ta cała sytuacja przywołuje wspomnienia naszej sytuacji w czasie wojny, kiedy musieliśmy ukrywać nasze pochodzenie, kiedy wyszliśmy, żeby ktoś nas nie zadenuncjował. Our response to the Ukrainian war, to the crisis, has been led by our Holocaust survivors who know more than anyone what it means to suffer and what it means to receive or not receive help at a time of, of crisis. The Krakow JCC relief effort was documented from its early days by the longtime American news photographer Chuck Fishman. As multi generational families poured in from all over Ukraine, the first requirement was food and then a safe place for the children to sleep. There was cell phone battery power so anxious mothers could contact home. There were shoes and boots provided in all sizes, and clothes for refugees who left home with nothing but the clothes on their backs. There was basic medical care and dental services. Classes were set up for kids until they could get into regular Polish schools. Eventually there were bicycles and even a summer camp experience. The JCC found hundreds of hotel rooms and apartments for refugees and even rented this large palace 20 kilometers outside of Krakow where 90 Ukrainian women and children have set up a community. Svetlana Savitska came here from Lviv, Ukraine and now volunteers in the palace organizing community events. Her daughter is a psychologist who provides counseling to trauma victims. She is amazed that all this is provided by the Jewish community. Here we celebrate all Jewish holidays, Catholic and our own. We are all united by humanity, decency and mutual assistance no matter what. 
не дивлячись ні на що. We saw that we're housing and feeding them, but they have uh, other needs. They, they, we need to get them into the workforce. So we started to teach them English. We started to teach them Polish. We started to help with job training. Many of them have gone through real trauma, separated from their families, sometimes things really awful, sexual violence. So we started to bring in counselors and to, to give them trauma treatment and uh, legal support. We help them if they want to immigrate somewhere else, if they need to travel somewhere else. Maria Lysenko has remained in Krakow, principally because she has a 12-year-old son who cannot hear or speak. And he has been enrolled in a special needs school here. He studies at school. He is under stress. He wants to go home. It is difficult for him in a regular school, but there, there are other children like him. I think that pain remained in the genes of Jewish people. Such people cannot stay away from the pain of other nations. Only those who have experienced such a terrible misfortune can understand other people. I'm sorry, these are emotions. It's, it's, it's hard. At the palace on the outskirts of Krakow, every Saturday there are piano lessons for young children. Some are learning to play songs in tribute to their Jewish hosts. Among the clients of the JCC are Marina Sokolova with her one-year-old son, Prokar, who hopes to emigrate to Canada. The Holocaust survivor and philosopher Abraham Joshua Heschel said the opposite of good is not evil. The opposite of good is indifference. The ongoing plight of the millions of Ukrainian war refugees is a test of the humanity of the modern world. The Jewish Community Center in Krakow is passing that test. Terence mentioned that some of those refugees you saw in his report have come to Canada. The Canadian government passed a special provision for emergency travel. More than a million Ukrainians applied for entry so far only 162,000 have arrived here. Next, more guns on Canadian streets are coming straight from the printer. It's just crazy, like that wire, it looks just like wire becomes this gun. The untraceable weapons made right at home, next. Police across the country are tracking a growing threat. 3D printed guns that can be created in secret and cannot be traced. Back in the winter, Ellen Morrow got a first-hand look at exactly how so-called ghost guns are made and how popular they're becoming. It's crazy that this becomes a full-out gun. This will soon be a ghost gun an untraceable firearm with no serial number anywhere on it. Homemade in just a few hours using a 3D printer. Just these layer, layer, layer turns into a firearm. Police across Canada are worried. They say these do-it-yourself weapons are a growing threat. There's a flood of 3D guns entering into the city. We contacted police forces across the country. These guns are commonly referred to as ghost guns. None of them have serial numbers. 3D printing firearms is highly illegal. There is definitely underworld and a criminal element to it. Seven agencies from large cities like Winnipeg to smaller ones like Sarnia told us there was a jump often a big one, in 3D printed gun seizures in 2022 over the previous year. More than 100 were seized nationwide. Calgary had one of the largest spikes. Police here seized 17 3D printed guns in 2022. The year before, just one. These guns can be 3D printed in someone's living room, in someone's bedroom, in someone's closet, without anyone knowing. 
These two firearms, we believe, were printed off of this machine. Mm. Acting the Staff way. Sergeant Ben Lawson heads up Calgary's Firearms Investigative Unit. This is a standard Glock style model, so the bottom part is all 3D printed, so the purple part and then the silver and black parts are commercially made. So someone would have printed this part on a 3D printer and then have gone to just a normal gun store and bought the metal pieces and put it together? You bet, yeah. So where there would be a serial number, there's just nothing. Exactly. The serial number is normally on the receiver or frame of a firearm, but that's the part that's 3D printed. Without that number, there's no way to trace these guns. Why would someone print one of these? Anything that they can do to make themselves more secret and uh, more anonymous is probably more advantageous to the criminal. Um, anyone can go online, purchase a computer, a laptop for $100, they can buy this for $300, and now they can start printing firearms. You can 3D print a firearm, all parts for say $500, and the markup is, is astronomical. We can see them range anywhere from $2,500 to $7,500 in Canada. There's a large and very active 3D printed gun community online. The Glock 26X. The AR pistol. All right, let's crank some rounds out of this. Creators showing off new designs to millions of followers. I printed this beautiful blue frame. And sharing exactly how to make them. So this is the YouTube page for one of these gun designers. And down in the comments, they actually tell people exactly where they can go to find the information to be able to print one of these guns. It links me to another site where the files are all there to be able to be downloaded. So I pick the gun that I want to print. And right here, in just a few clicks, I'm able to download a guide and all the files and information to be able to print this weapon. Actually, printing a gun in Canada is illegal, but downloading these instruction manuals isn't. And anyone can buy the extra parts from a gun store or online without a firearms license. In the U.S., 3D printed guns are legal in most states, including Wisconsin, where we've come to meet one of the gun designers who puts those files on the internet. We see this as freedom of speech, it's an art form. Ethan Middleton has designed five 3D printed guns. This handgun I designed, called the Schnitzel. His files for making them downloaded thousands of times. Why put these instructions on the internet? I think these types of things being out in the public uh, help responsible adults and responsibly armed people stay responsibly armed, whether the government thinks that they should be able to or not. Do you get messages from Canadians about this? I do, yeah. Um, there's, there's a couple of dudes who message basically just looking at the files saying, hey, I really appreciate what you're doing, but they make it clear that they're not manufacturing them themselves. Then you do have some people who are totally not, wink wink, uh, manufacturing these. I would assume that these people aren't bringing these firearms out in public uh, to like shooting ranges and stuff like that, but... It's hard to know. Correct, yeah, who knows. Do you ever worry about one of your files with your instructions getting into the hands of someone who might then use the gun to commit a violent crime? If something were to happen with one of my firearms and innocent lives were lost, that would really suck. But the real situation of that is, if it's not my design, it's gonna be someone else's. We just got the filament set. We'll get the files ready to get sent over, and then uh, we'll hit print. Remember this? This gun took about seven hours to print. We sped up the footage. All right, so the print finished overnight. The Schnitzel, Glock 19, nine millimeter handgun. Um, now we were able to print this pretty quickly because this machine's really fancy and really expensive, but traditionally this print would have taken around 30 hours. It's just crazy like that wire, it looks just like wire becomes this gun. It takes Ethan about 40 minutes to fit the metal pieces into the plastic frame. Springs, pins, and stuff like that. There's always post-processing, things that need to be done to make it functional. 
That is a completed, essentially, Glock 19. Then we go with Ethan to see if it actually works. So we're gonna be shooting into this pile of wood here. All right. All right, here we go. And there it is, a brand new firearm, completely under the radar. So it reset, everything looks good to me. The weapon is still alive, so no one's going to be allowed in front of the muzzle. Guns are potentially dangerous tools. They need to be respected. In Canada, the past year has seen headline after headline after headline. Stories about alleged 3D printed gun manufacturing rings and weapons being seized. But how many are not? In Toronto, we ask Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino why the government hasn't done more sooner to get ahead of this rise. It's so easy to find the files that you would need to make the guns online. It's easy to go out there and get a 3D printer. It just seems like the train has already left the station with this problem. Well, I think we can stop the train in its tracks. It isn't just the ability to access the 3D technology, although that's one part of it, uh, but to then use that technology or that software for the purpose of manufacturing a component or a ghost gun in its entirety is something that we are actively exploring as a potential legislative a response to the problem. This is technology that is new, but it has been around for a few years. Why haven't you done more sooner to stop this? Well, we've been active. Um, we put in place a national ban on assault style rifles. We put in place the a national 3D, handgun 3D freeze. 3D printed guns specifically. And we have a plan in place to deal specifically with ghost guns, which does involve more investments in law enforcement, expanding our legislative tool kit, a robust collaboration with the United States, and sending a strong message to criminals that if you think you're going to use ghost guns to get away with it, you're wrong. But with so much information already out there, the parts and printers so accessible, the threat of 3D printed guns is likely to grow. 3D printing is definitely one on the rise in there. And then as the technology gets better, it's going to make it easier. How big of a challenge do you see this becoming? I wasn't a big proponent of putting a lot of resources into 3D printed guns here in Calgary because we just didn't see them. We're seeing this uptick in 2022, so who knows what 2023 is going to bring. Since Ellen Morrow's investigation, 2023 has brought more ghost guns and more arrests. Last month, police across the country carried out a series of raids targeting manufacturers of these ghost guns. They arrested 45 people and seized more than 400 guns, including 3D printed handguns, long guns and silencers. Next, actor Ryan Gosling sneak, sneaks up on our own reporter on live TV. Being what you can be and at the same time, and here it is. Yeah, hi, why don't we, we can. <laughs> We go behind the scenes of a red carpet surprise in our moment. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Ugh. Hi, Ken. Hi, Ken. The much anticipated Barbie movie will hit theaters this month, but it's the Kens who hit the red carpet this week in Toronto, specifically the Canadian Kens, Ryan Gosling and Simu Liu. CBC's Eli Glasner was on that red carpet reporting live on television when one of the Kens snuck up behind him. The startling reaction is our moment. Being what you can be and at the same time, and here it is. Yeah, hi, why don't we? Talk we, to you? we can. We talk, <laughs> hey. No wants to talk to us. Uh, we, uh, so we were on the pink carpet for this Barbie event. I was getting ready to go live on Canada Tonight with Dwight Drummond. And this is one of the trickiest things as an entertainment journalist, because you have the show in one ear, and with another ear, you're trying to kind of be aware of what's happening around you. This is the thing we do on every red carpet. The holy grail is to get the talent live and it's so hard. So now here we are again, show's almost done. I have one more live hit and Ryan Gosling is three reporters away. So what do I do? I start my spiel, I'm talking about Barbie and, and then I feel something on my shoulders. And here it is. Yeah, hi, why don't we, we can. Of course, I turn around 
and it's Mr. Charming, Ryan Gosling. Hey, you know, one wants to talk to me. Say hi to, to CBC News. I wasn't expecting it, and uh, it's funny, he actually apologized afterwards as if anyone would be upset. No, it's all right, it's all right. Sorry, sorry. There you go. That apology is proof enough of uh, his Canadian roots, and very clearly, no one can flummox Eli Glasner. Very impressive. Ryan Gosling's sister was beside him there. That is The National for July 2nd. Have a good night.